good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. And thank you for being here. Um, I'm, I'm uh, happy to have uh, these panelists with me today and to be a moderator of this panel. And I'm a Maroc I am Rocco Saverino, a PhD researcher at the VUB, and uh, I'm part of the LSTS research group. And this panel organization falls under the uh, articulating law, technology, ethics, and politics, is issues of enforcement and jurisdiction of EU data protection law under beyond GDPR, a very, very long title for a project. So we can say just Alta PDP project. And uh, actually my PhD research is quite in line with, with this uh, topic today, we're going to discuss today. But before introducing the topic, I would like to, to introduce the panelists. Uh, so we have Maria Makierska, uh, she's a PhD researcher at the European um, University Institute of Florence. Uh, she's researching cooperation between EU national data protection authorities under the GDPR. And uh, she's interested in uh, digital governance and EU administrative law on the ground. Uh, then we have also Julia, Julia Gentile. She's a lecturer in uh, law at Essex Law School, uh, her research focuses on uh, the promotion of human rights uh, in the digital society and the EU constitutional law. She's particularly interested in um, the use of the AI uh, in the legal profession and ju justice systems. Then on my right, uh, my right, we have Brendan Van Elsenoy. He is deputy head of unit policy and consultation at the European Data Protection Supervisor. He previously worked as a legal advisor and acting head of unit at the Belgian Data Protection Authority. And then we have uh, Michael, uh, Miguel, uh, Miguel Valle del Olmo. Sorry for the English <laughs> mixing. And uh, he was a deputy director uh, general for artificial intelligence and digital enabling technology at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Digital Transformation of Spain and now is working at the Spanish permanent representation to EU here in Brussels. Um, well, uh, the, I, I think this topic is very, very interesting and timely. And uh, I'm not just saying this because, as I already mentioned, this is in line with my, uh, with my research, uh, but because uh, when we talk about the AI Act, we talk about uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, aspects, but we lose sight of the, uh, one of the most important one uh, when a law is introduced. And uh, uh, this is which, how, which and how uh, this uh, uh, law will be enforced and who will oversee this enforcement. Um, and consequently, uh, the, the possible overlaps between the disregulation, as we will see today, for AI Act and the GDPR. Um, indeed, the AI Act enshrines in Article 3 uh, that national competent authority means a notifying authority or a market surveillance authority. Then Article 70 uh, provides that each member state shall establish or designate as national competent authorities at least one notifying authority and at least one market surveillance authority. And although there, there seems that there are no doubt uh, as, the, as the DPA's, um, as DPA competence to in data protection and algorithm, also if we take into account the Article 22 of uh, GDPR, uh, I think there are some doubts about uh, the possible inconsistency uh, in the choice of the, 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 the competent authorities uh, among the, the different member, member states. And this actually was one of the concern also of the, uh, the, the EDPS. And because of this, I would like to start with Brandon because uh, EDPS stressed uh, the importance of appointing the data protection authorities, the national competent authorities, uh, even, uh, uh, I mean, ADPS did this 
in the joint uh, uh, opinion with the DPP, but also in uh, the last uh, uh, opinion uh, you published uh, the 44, 2023. So uh, this raised questions about how uh, the act and the, the, the GDPR enforcement could, could be affect. And for instance, in this case, uh, we will discuss later, but Spain has already decided to set up the an agency incorporated under the, the, the Ministry for Digital Transformation, uh, while in France, the, Con the Council of State uh, welcomes the reorganization of CNIL, uh, making, the, it's, uh, making the, the CNIL the competent authority, right? Uh, but in, that, in this case, with specialized department. So my questions in this case uh, are, uh, if authorities order than DPAs, and DPAs comes into play as national competent authorities uh, for the act. Uh, what consequence do you think uh, uh, we will have on the consistency of both regulations? Uh, is this a serious risk of overlapping? And how will a DPS uh, actively collaborate? Uh, what will be its role and what limitation uh, will it face? Thank you, Brent. Thank you very much, uh, Rocco, and I, good afternoon to you all. I, I feel like I'm back in school uh, to some extent. Um, I hope I don't get a sense of vertigo, and I hope uh, we will be able to entertain you in this late afternoon with some, some interesting discussions. Um, as Rocco mentioned, uh, um, both EDPS and EDPB, when we were assessing the proposal uh, for an AI Act, uh, recommended uh, to the union legislator to consider designating data protection authorities as competent uh, supervisory authorities under the AI Act. And I thought what I would do is perhaps maybe start my intervention by explaining a bit the rationale for that choice, um, because this might also help to shed some, uh, uh, some insights uh, as regards uh, the future. So the starting point was that because many AI systems uh, rely on processing of personal data, data protection authorities are actually already uh, in the context of their current mandate uh, and competences, supervising uh, AI systems. And so, to some extent, they already have the expertise which is required by the AI Act to do this uh, oversight, specifically when it comes also to understanding the functioning of AI systems and assessing their potential impact on fundamental rights. Another, perhaps more practical reason, was that indeed very often the material scope um, of these acts, they will have a strong, I would say, interconnection or, or overlap. Um, and so we will find ourselves in a situation with multiple entities regulating uh, uh, similar activities under the guise of, of, of different frameworks, which nevertheless do have some points of, uh, of interconnection. And so designating DPAs in that particular case seemed like a straightforward option with a view of you know, promoting consistency, but also uh, just for, for, for market players and for data subjects, you know, to, for controllers to have a single point of contact uh, to address these issues. And last but not least, uh, data protection authorities have a, a constitutionally guaranteed independence, uh, which is provided uh, by the charter, but also by the treaty. And, and, and effectively, I mean, in our view, this is something which is very important when we, when we think about the impact of, uh, of AI systems on, on fundamental rights. Um, but so what does the AI Act say? Uh, and I think we're we are all here together to try to uh, navigate the maze um, as, the, uh, as the panel provides. Um, and so I think it's very, I think it's very interesting. Uh, um, and, and so here are just some, some preliminary thoughts. I, I, indeed, the AI Act does provide the possibility uh, or the choice to, to member states uh, um, to designate. Uh, provided, of course, they satisfy the, the requirements of expertise, which touch also on data protection, but also on other matters. Um, but there is one very important caveat, which, which I think, so far talking to people, I, I, I understand this, is, is not everybody is fully aware, is that there is a specific situation or a specific set of AI systems where the AI Act effectively mandates uh, designation of uh, um, data protection authorities under the GDPR or under the law enforcement directive to, to be competent uh, uh, as market surveillance authorities and also as conformity assessment bodies. And so this is specifically in relation to AI systems that are used in the area of law enforcement, border management, justice and democracy. 
uh, and the ones that are listed in the annex. And also when it comes to remote biometric identification, biometric categorization, and emo motion recognition in those areas. And so I think it's also important to kind of underline that in any case, data protection authorities, national data protection authorities will have a, um, a specific role to play also under the AI Act, also under this you know, market surveillance uh, regulatory approach. Um, in addition to already overseeing and enforcing uh, data protection legislation. Now, the role of the EDPS is, is, is in a way uh, much more simple, much more straightforward. Uh, already under the proposal uh, itself, the EDPS was designated as the competent authority, which effectively means we will be tasked with doing it all. Uh, um, and it's something that, of course, we're very much looking forward to uh, uncovering and, and, and doing and, and fully in the process of also preparing. Um, but when I try to take a step back and look at where does this leave us in terms of the overall uh, landscape, um, I think there is going to be, and again, looking at this mainly from the perspective of a DPA, uh, there's going to be quite some heterogeneity, uh, let's say, uh, given the fact that indeed member states are, 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 are free to make certain choices with certain limits. And so there's going to be DPAs that, that are mainly going to have a role under the GDPR, plus those cases where the AI Act explicitly requires it. Uh, and then others where indeed there will be additional competences flowing from the choices made at, um, at political level. So there's going to be a multitude, uh, um, I think, of, of, of regulatory bodies and not all of them are going to be from the same uh, background. Um, and I think this is going to be uh, interesting to see uh, how the, the cooperation will, will materialize in practice because it's, it's something that I think does require uh, um, cooperation amongst the regulatory authorities to have uh, uh, the consistency in such a setup. And so, um, fortunately, there are some uh, uh, provisions in the Act which also specifically try to address this. Huh? So, the AI Act recognizes the need to cooperate uh, by market surveillance authorities especially with uh, other authorities charged with protecting fundamental rights, and this obviously includes uh, data protection authorities, and it provides for different mechanisms, uh, distinguishing perhaps between national level and EU level. And so at national level, there's, there's really quite a, a number of different ways. So the, the first is, of course, in relation to guidance providing activities. There, there is an explicit uh, uh, indication of a need to uh, um, consult uh, other competent authorities as appropriate, but perhaps more interestingly, also in the supervision of AI systems that uh, present a certain risk. Um, and there, where there are AI systems that present a risk to fundamental rights, market surveillance authorities are actually obliged to uh, cooperate uh, and inform, uh, inform and cooperate data protection authorities when they have uh, um, a reason to consider um, that those systems present, uh, present a risk. Um, and then when it, they will assess uh, together uh, also the compliance with the, with the regulation and specifically also the risk for fundamental rights. And even if there's a finding that the system does comply uh, with the requirements of the regulation, there may still be situations where they consider there is still um, a risk for fundamental rights. And again, DPAs will be involved uh, in that assessment and measures to the extent that uh, personal data protection issues are at stake. There are other examples when it comes to reporting of serious incidents, there has to be also a, a further information. There's also some additional powers for DPAs under the AI Act in the sense that they would also be allowed to have access to the documentation um, that needs to be uh, made available, uh, needs to be kept pursuant to the, uh, to the AI Act and also request, uh, uh, have the ability to request where they themselves are not the market surveillance uh, authority. Um, if the documentation is not sufficient to establish whether or not there is an infringement to, uh, um, to organize uh, testing of high-risk AI systems. And then, then finally, uh, there's of course also the role for, for DPAs to be played in the context of AI sandboxes that involve processing of personal data. Um, at the European level, we, we see yet another, I would say, governance structure emerge. Uh, for those of you who have been following the digital rulebook space for a while, um, you will see that uh, every act has slightly different um, approaches when it comes to you know, cooperation between national authorities, what's at national level, what's at EU level, what's the body 
uh, uh, that is created to ensure potential coordination, cooperation, etc. Um, at the EU level, we have the AI office, uh, which will have, of course, a, as you know, a very prominent role in, in, in the oversight of general purpose AI systems, but it will also provide uh, the secretariat for the AI board, um, which will bring together national competent authorities, uh, plus also the EDPS participating as an observer. Um, interestingly, in the tasks of the AI board, there is also a duty to cooperate with other uh, union institutions, networks that have uh, um, relevant competences uh, um, to the subject matter uh, with which the board is dealing. So that's also, I think, something that will need to be explored going further. So I'd like to end uh, my intervention with perhaps just three, three concluding remarks. So I think from a DPA perspective, the AI Act is going to be bringing many novelties. Um, specifically also with regards to the tasks that are being entrusted which fall under, uh, uh, which come from market surveillance uh, regulation. I, I try to make the case why I think DPAs are indeed well suited to, to, to exercise uh, those tasks and as EDPS we're happy to take on this role. Um, it's going to be important going forward to ensure coherence and, and, and complementarity. The AI Act provides for, for, for a number of avenues and possibilities, which I think are going to be uh, very important to try to utilize um, to the fullest extent. Obviously, there's going to be a learning process involved. Obviously, there's going to be additional insights uh, along the way, but we need to find a way to make it work. And this is something that uh, we as EDPS also underline and has been, you know, a common thread in our approach when we were reviewing all these legislative proposals, Digital Markets Act, Digital Service Act, AI Act, Data Governance Act, Data Act, etc., is the need to make sure that, you know, enforcement can be complementary and effective um, on the ground. And so, while today we're here to, to talk mainly about the AI Act, uh, it is of course also important to keep an eye on, let's say, the broader um, regulatory landscape. And so, as one of the initiatives to celebrate our uh, 20th anniversary. Uh, we're planning to put out a position paper in the second half of this year, which is going to look more, uh, I would say, holistically at the, uh, at the future of cross-regulatory uh, uh, governance in the, in the digital sphere. And so very much looking forward to the discussion also with the other panelists today, because I'm sure it's going to be food for thought, and also looking forward to the uh, conversation with the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you for this insightful uh, uh, answers. I mean, I I I, put, I post you a lot of questions, so I I know that it's a lot. But uh, probably we will discuss later also with the audience uh, uh, a bit more about it. And now I would like to move to Miguel. Uh, well, in this case, uh, I would say uh, that Spain almost went against uh, the 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 opinion of uh, ADVP, ADVPS, in the sense that already in uh, uh, August 2023, uh, I remember was published the, 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 the statute, const um, constitute, uh, the constitu constitutive statute uh, about the, uh, uh, the agency uh, for the supervision of artificial intelligence in Spain. Um, so in, in this case, I, I would like to know uh, as basic, basic questions, uh, why uh, Spain deci decided to do this if, um, at uh, the very beginning, if we compare uh, with the final stage uh, reached out by the, the, the act yesterday, let's say, and what are the benefits of having uh, uh, an agency as the national competent authority under the, the ministry um, uh, of the, 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 the digital transformation. In this case, uh, perhaps uh, could be uh, a problem of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, independence. Uh, so I, I would like to know what are your thoughts about, about, about this. Thank you. Well, <coughs> uh, th th thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, um, I'm, I'm super honored to be here. Um, well, um, I think that we have to put all a little bit in context. I have been in just a little bit of a piece, little piece of information. I have been in the negotiations of the AI Act since 21st of April 2021, meaning the first day the text was published. So I was making the position for Spain 
during the council negotiations until the general approach. Then, under our presidency, I was, I was the person negotiating with the parliament the text. So, <clears throat> I have received a huge amount of inputs during the negotiations about how the text should look like. And we have taken utmost importance of the advices from the EVPS, but there are more than, than the EVPS on the one hand, and on the other hand, the original proposal from the commission didn't say anything like this. So I think that we, I think that we should try to put in context what do we have on the table, okay? Why do I say this? Because of course the AI Act is a piece of legislation that has a lot to do with the GDPR. We are talking about fundamental rights and one of the most problematic <coughs> violations are that one that concerns privacy. That I think that we are all in, on the same page. But then the AI Act is much more than that. And why do I say this? Artificial intelligence is a horizontal technology and it's used everywhere. If one reads the impact assessment of the AI Act, you will see that privacy is an important thing that can be violated. It's an important risk to deal with, the risk to privacy but you have risks to the access to education, you have risks to the access to wealth, you have risks to the access to employment, you have risks to health and safety, which is all about the, fundamental, the AI Act, health, safety, and fundamental rights. What does that mean? That you don't have a monolithic environment. You are talking about a very eclectic landscape, which involves a lot of authorities, a lot of different knowledges, and this is something that has been pointed out that the market surveillance authorities must have um, knowledge in different fields. And therefore, you have to make choices because they have impact in many, many places. Now, when it, com when it comes to, to choices, well, before, before that, um, one more thing that I would like to say is that um, the AI Act has a lot of elements, but if you have a quick, a quick look, it looks much more like the medical devices regulation than to the GDPR. That's the reality. Be why? Because it's product safety legislation, okay? It's not a general data protection regulation. For general data protection regulation, we have the GDPR, and that's great, and that's why uh, we also feel safe in the sense that DPAs will be doing their work, which has been up to date, remarkable. At least this is what we feel in Spain from, from our DPA. So in that context, uh, we have the proposal from the commission saying, okay, you have to, uh, you need to manage your market surveillance authorities and you might have different ones. Why do they say this? Because uh, now the Annex 1, it used to be Annex 2, but now it's Annex 1. In that sense, just a quick reply, the text is quite stable since December, to be frank. And right now we have only had uh, the recitals in the two first weeks of January and everything, the rest was editorial. And in that regard, um, in that regard, Annex 1, because it, ch it changed now, it's a list of the product safety legislations that are in place. And right now, at least how it's organized in Spain, the market surveillance authority for the medical devices will be the market surveillance authority for medical devices under the AI Act. Why? Because uh, I don't know that the medical devices company that is go undergoing a third party conformity assessment will now have to comply with more things which are specifically related to the requirements in the AI Act. The same thing for aviation, the same thing for cars, the same thing for elevators, the same things for machinery. So you start with a very much fragmented landscape of regulators. That's the first point. Second point, when you go to the Annex 3, and there we go for the fundamental rights, you have different kinds of systems, okay? You have systems that have an impact, well, that are related to employment, you have systems that are related to public services, you have systems that are related to immigration, justice, or law enforcement, as pointed out, and Let's say that the, that the way that member states have that organized in order to supervise the activities with, uh, within those, uh, uh, let's say, areas, it's, it's not equal. It's, it, it differs from one country to another. And what we have to be sure is the fact that we have a powerful coordinator of whatever 
authority that are going to uh, supervise that, either previously or either within the frame of the AI Act, because some things, I mean, in th those areas, there are already regulators doing some things, and now with the AI Act, you will have to do more things for supervising that the provider is coming with, 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 with the things uh, correctly done, that the uh, deployer is, uh, is doing their fundamental rights impact assessment, well, some things, okay, that, that are there. So, in the end, we thought, okay, we have this landscape, we might, even though if this was in, uh, in some months ago, we thought that some sensitive areas such as law enforcement or, or immigration could have a different treatment, and that's how it ended up happening. Now you have to be either the DPA or either an independent authority complying with Articles 41 to 44 of the data of the, of the law enforcement directive. So we know that there are some areas that are sensitive, but we know that there are many people on the table, that there is one common tool for all of them when, it's, when it comes to reporting incidents, when identifying risks, and when sharing all those incidents, which is not the GDPR, which is not the AI Act itself, which is the product safety legislation. And when you have to withdraw a system because it, because it has a problem, what you have to know about is about product safety legislation because there are procedures that are in place already and that are working. And they are working for medical devices, they are working for chemicals. So, with this landscape, we thought, powerful coordinator, he will be sup supervising some things. Does that mean that we won't have a fruitful exchange and a proper coordination with the DPIs? No, we are going to be all the time coordinating with them. Actually, we have already started works in sandboxing, and one of the most powerful voices in Spain is the DPA. Why? because we are aware of the sensitivity of the personal data. And we are aware that the ones that know about it are the DPAs, and we don't doubt that. And with that framework, what we are trying to do is to coordinate very well internally to give legal certainty to both companies and citizens and making all these procedures that could be very complicated as, much, as, as easy as possible. And during the negotiations, of course, taking into account the EDPS uh, opinion, which was very important, but also taking into account that all the member states asked for one thing. Please give us freedom to organize ourselves because there are already systems in place. And if we come with a unified solution for everyone, it won't fit for all. So we try to respect that during the negotiations while trying to listen in to the sensitivity of certain areas such as law enforcement. And in that regard, of course, DPAs will have a, a, a role. Eh? But for justice, there's one specific paragraph in the regulation which says that whatever a data protection agency does, it won't undermine the independence of the judicial powers. So for many countries, I can see that the judicial power will overview the justice uh, area of the Annex 3. Maybe not, but I think that there's a decent possibility of that happening. So, I think that my intervention ends up here, but what we did was not out of the blue. It was not trying to ignore the EDPS, which we respect, and, and, and of course, and, and I spent a lot of time reading the opinion from the EDPS. But we had to take that into account, and also all the other information that we had on the table. So that's why in Spain, we went for this model, which is announced, we are working heavily on that, to be frank, it's also under construction. We are hiring our director, and we will need to build up the team, and we will need to set up a framework where everybody is correctly organized and well communicated. And I think that's what we have on, on the dish right now. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think you you were uh, you were very very clear and. Uh, I, Actually, mine was a, a little bit provocative question, so <laughs> you got it. But of course, uh, but of course, uh, um, I think uh, of, this is something that uh, make uh, us think about it. And also, Spain uh, is viewed like a model uh, in the in this sense because some uh, other member states now are 
are starting to, to follow this model uh, a little bit. Uh, I will say in Italy we have this uh, draft uh, law proposal where they are splitting the the the, 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 co the the national competence authority in two uh, between the the, the cyber security agency and the the agency similar to Spain under the the digital uh, infrastructure so it's a bit uh, unclear yet but uh, a, a good point uh, I would say that Spain uh, made is that already decided and is the only one at the moment uh, more or less but. Uh, now I would like to to, to move to to Maria uh, because we mentioned also the, the GDPR. We, mes we mentioned the um, the holistic approach of uh, the AI Act, and uh, uh, I, I think that there is this inevitable connection between the uh, AI Act and uh, and the GDPR, of course. And uh, I would like to uh, to know what, what are your thoughts about the impact of the AI Act. Uh, on uh, the, uh, the the digital enforcement and consequently the data subjects and uh, my question in this case uh, will be what lessons uh, uh, can be learned from GDPR and apply to AI Act uh, even even though it's not uh, uh, the same thing as, as you already said but I think we have to uh, to think about it. We have to we have this uh, very very strong regulation, uh, and we have to in this way to to to, uh, to reply uh, to replicate in, in a little bit this model. Also, or, or I would say to to learn from the mistakes uh, we did before uh, with the GDPR. For example, I like ADPP under Article 65 uh, of GDPR. The AI, AI board. Uh, does not have the power to uh, to review the national the national supervisor supervisor agency and uh, settle uh, uh, the disputes between the national authorities with binding binding for forces. So I think this could be a disadvantage um, because uh, uh, this uh, could uh, uh, endangering the uniform application of of law. And in, uh, if certain member states uh, apply or interpret the, the AI Act uh, uh, in a very unique way, as already happened in the past with, for instance, the Irish Data Protection Authority. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rocco, uh, for these questions. Um, so I think after listening also to Miguel and uh, Brendan, that there are just three main issues here, and I'm very glad to be able to discuss it with, uh, here at you, with you today, with so many great experts, uh, both on the panel and in the audience, because I think we will stay with these questions for at least a couple of next years after the AIAC will be implemented, but also the DSA and the whole uh, digital package that is going there. And these questions are, uh, in general. The first one is this overlap between AI Act and the GDPR. Uh, which one uh, is, are they complementary, are they opposite, and so on, and what is the, the impact on both of them? The second one is this enforcement question on how to design appropriately institutional framework in such a way the enforcement will be effective and how it was done in the AI Act and the, how it was done in the GDPR. And finally, and I think it is the most interesting question, but it's not discussed enough, uh, is this EU level of enforcement and the question of horizontal and vertical cooperation between national authorities, as well as who is going to take this power, enforcement power on the EU level. And uh, so I will try to uh, address this question as pointing out what I see as potential opportunities and potential traps for in all of them. And uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards because honestly, I don't think anyone at this point has a real uh, and clear answers of, um, of what's going on. So uh, when it comes to this first point, so the overlap GDPR or AI, so we already heard about, uh, about this uh, from Miguel and Brennan, and these were these two opposite views that I think stem uh, to these objectives of both the GDPR and the AI Act. The GDPR is the law regulation that regulates the fundamental rights to data protection, plus the, the ensures the flow, uh, the flow of data, right? And AI Act, in the meantime, is the one that is to promote the uptake of AI and uh, improve functioning of the market and support innovation. So I think it's clear 
that these two, uh, two regulations are not opposite, they are definitely complementary in this sense that GDPR it has this individual approach where it puts an individual in, at the forefront and data subject with all these rights as a central pillar of the government, while the AI Act on the reverse is uh, this market regulation that uh, has almost the, collect the most more coherent approach, more global one, uh, in the sense that it, well, it just takes more from the product safety governance style, as Miguel just uh, explained to us, rather than this individual-based approach. So I think it's good because the, this is how the AI Act fills the gap that was there uh, with the GDPR. Um, however, what we see uh, is also this, this problem that GDPR and AI Act are both very ubiquitous, right? So I, when I, you were talking about the AI, how it is a general application, how it applies to every sector possible, I was thinking about data protection. Uh, data protection is everywhere now, and the court keeps on the, introducing the broader and broader definition of what is personal data, what is the data processing. So by now, I think we have both the very broad data protection scope here, that almost everything is personal data, and also maybe uh, a, the same with the, will be with the AI application. So that's why I think it's so important to be clear on how these two rights, uh, two regulations interact with each other. Um, the, because for now, we can, what we can see already is that GDPR for the AI uh, regulation works in the same sort of data protection. And we saw it with uh, Garanta decision on OpenAI when they suspended it uh, functioning. There was a clear UAI decision. There were at least a couple of others. So it is possible to uh, use the GDPR as enforcement measure. However, the AI Act here, and I, I think it's, this is uh, innovation as opposed to GDPR, it actually, it, it's more of a regulation that, um, uh, that tries to introduce sort of a dialogue between all of these authorities, and you can tell it through the text of the GDPR, the, to the AI Act, sorry, that you have so many authorities, but each of them has this option to voice their concerns, and same is for the producers. So it's all about finding the right right to, uh, to find the common grants and also the fact that the authorities are even involved in the set, uh, product design and preparation when it comes to the, for example, the uh, regulatory sandboxes. That's, that's very interesting and that's not the case in the GDPR where the DPAs are like over the, uh, over, uh, over the controllers and just see what they are doing down there. So uh, that brings me to the second point in how the AI Act is div designed differently when it comes uh, to comparison with the GDPR. And so as we, saw, we heard already, there's this big freedom of the government uh, to decide on the identity, uh, identity and the number of national authorities. That's, uh, that's what actually worries me more than the identity. It's also the number, that it can be many uh, authorities. There's a lot of freedom here. I heard, for example, the Polish government just uh, announced that probably it will be a board actually to, uh, to enforce the AI Act that will consist of all these smaller authorities, like smaller in the sense of uh, not uh, relevant for their own sectors. So uh, then there is this problem with the, the, the skills that are required to be uh, employee of the authority. This is so broad. Um, and why I understand the motivation, like it has to be broad since the AI uh, uh, systems have such a broad application, but then is it possible even if we see, and this is the lesson learned from the GDPR, if we see that the DPAs who are these well-established authorities, uh, long-standing, uh, very, very protected level of independence, they, star they are the ones struggling with the sufficient resources all over the EU, and uh, they are the ones that are already there. So I think in reality, it might be very difficult to actually uh, fill out uh, the gap. And um, one of the most important questions here is the independence that was, I think you mentioned it already, so that it's a fact that GDPAs are protected by the Charter. It's not the case for these market surveillance authorities under the AI Act. And the consequence of that is also the, is uh, essentially the accountability. And the, if the, the such authority with such a great powers that it's not only market supervision, it's also the fundamental right protection here, uh, are involved with the government, it, uh, it might be problematic uh, in the context of respecting the, uh, the rules of EU administrative law, the, the principles that we have in the EU as to pro the, when it comes to the boundaries between the administration. So, uh, but we will see how it obviously play out uh, in, the, um, uh, in, uh, in practice. What is important because of that is 
to have the good rules on cooperation that will allow uh, the harmonious application of the law, but also that will allow uh, for this some margin of uh, independence that is needed and this procedural autonomy that is necessary because otherwise this one size fits all uh, method, it's not good, it's, uh, it won't be effective uh, as uh, Miguel was already saying. So um, this is what brings me to the, my third point, is, which is this cooperation mechanism level. And this is the subject where the GDPR and AI Act perhaps differ the most when it comes to procedure. So in GDPR, we had this very relevatory mechanism, the one-stop shop, where DPAs cooperating together with the EDTB that has uh, binding competences. And that's, I think, is very bold, even though this mechanism is far from being perfect, uh, the, this very bold attempt to actually introduce a regulation that does not involve the European Commission. And these are the separate independent authorities there that are handling the, the regulation that is the, designed for their purposes and for their competences. Uh, AI Act, in order probably to avoid these problems that we have, um, unfortunately, with the GDPR enforcement, takes a step back and gives this power, the new powers, to the Commission. And it's perhaps for me a, a moment to just ask, uh, even looking at the DSA and all the other digital package laws where the Commission has the powers, that why, uh, what is the motivation behind it? And whether this is the best solution to give the Commission this much power, because at some point, the European Commission is still a political body, apart from being just an uh, enforcer of single regulation of AI Act. And apart from the judicial rights, they are also enforcing other spectrums. So suddenly it becomes this very super, uh, super authority to regulate everything, while at the same time being a political body. And I'm not saying I have the, I'm critical of the Commission right now, I am not. It, I'm just saying that at some point we will need to have this discussion about <coughs> how to design uh, the procedural framework in the EU uh, in this perhaps a bit different level, maybe the EU, indeed the EU authority for digital rights as an independent uh, authority, maybe something else. But the focus for now was on the substantive law, of course. But I think it's, the, it's time for the next years to just think more carefully, just, just to think of how to design the EU administrative law in this uh, world where uh, it all just gets together so closely and so... Uh, and just intersects too much, and these levels of national and European uh, of enforcement are not uh, distinct anymore. And um, when it comes to the AI uh, and the board, so as you mentioned, Rocco, the board in the AI, uh, it's merely advisory, um, but it is the commission that has banding competences. And uh, so when the case goes to this higher level, uh, when it's high risk or uh, when the national authority decides there is a... Uh, uh, there, there, there is actually hi higher risk or something similar, then um, if the commission doesn't like the measure taken by the national authority, then it can just uh, uh, revoke it. And I think it's a very powerful measure that the commission has here, even though it's obviously designed only for some of the cases. I think the GDPR here was more, bro more bold in just acknowledging that it can be the board of the DPAs agreeing together on the measure, because then we have this one decision that was uh, effect of this negotiations between the DPAs and just reflects their interests. And even the court recently in the IAB case just confirmed that this is the power of this decision, that it was agreed by so many uh, authorities. And uh, I think, do I have the time? Yeah, okay. So I would just to like to finish with just saying that we still have time. There will be just this, as we saw with the GDPR, how it evolved. And I think we will be just observing this now couple of, uh, very intense years on how all these new regulations will come out in practice and how it will actually look like on the ground. And I'm very curious to see it and to hear. So, so thanks so much. Thank you, Maria, for this very intense uh, intervention. And uh, actually, I agree in part with what you just say, but we will uh, uh, later discuss uh, with also with the audience, so if you have some questions, please uh, write down uh, your questions now because Ma Julia will be the last one, but not the least one. Uh, and I would like to to uh, to address another uh, related, uh, let's say, uh, uh, argument, uh, which is the Article 47 of the Charter of Fund Fundamental Rights, uh, because I think uh, there is. I mean, there is a, an influence of an, an, an AI Act, 
uh, and in my I, 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 in, in this case when I, when I read the AI act I noticed that uh, there are mm, the word fundamental rights appears uh, uh, almost uh, 100 times uh, while the judicial remedies only twice while in the GDPR there are a lot of reference to to the judicial remedies uh, but still the uh, the role of fundamental rights is, is important also in the AI act uh, so in this case, I would like to ask you what is the role uh, of the judicial remedy in the context of AI? Um, if you think that Article uh, 47, in fact, the coordination between the national uh, authorities and how the, does this, the, the, the right to effective judicial remedy uh, affect the coordination of administrative and judicial enforcement, uh, especially in case uh, different uh, uh, layers of administration uh, are involved uh, due to the different approach taken uh, by uh, the different member states. One with uh, uh, DPAs, another one with uh, uh, market surveillance authorities. So I think uh, there are a lot to, to say and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Rocco, and uh, thanks to to the panelists. I uh, I've learned a lot, I have to say. So uh, that's that's great, um, and uh, these are all great questions because I think that um, we have here three issues based on you know what you just asked me. So the first one is really what is the role of judicial remedies in the context of AI and I would say the AI Act uh, more in general. Uh, a second question is, um, what is the role, if any, uh, for Article 47 in shaping uh, the maze? Uh, how, can Article 47, as the center of gravity for effective judicial protection, um, uh, what can this provision do, essentially, uh, to um, uh, guide us throughout the, the maze? Um, and then another question, which is that of coordination between administrative and judicial remedies. So um, in these 10 minutes, <laughs> I'll try to answer all of them. Um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to, um, uh, to, be, to be brief, but, but effective at the same time. So um, I'll start with the first question. Um, and I would like to... Um, bring to the table the fact that, um, uh, well, we're, we're really here touching the, the cracks of, of the EU legal order, right? Because when we talk about effective judicial protection, uh, the role of um, uh, individuals and how courts can, can protect them, in the EU we're really talking about one of the pillars of the EU constitutional system, right? There is a narrative that permeates uh, the EU legal order where individuals, whereby individuals are at the center of the constitutional architecture and courts are uh, considered to be the guardians, um, both at the EU and the national level, in particular the national level, I would say, of rights in the European Union. And this narrative is present in many frameworks. And um, surprisingly, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, of course, also the GDPR. Um, and even though we have this attention to the concept of rights and the role of courts in protecting rights, what we witness in reality is a contradiction. Uh, while the role of courts is seen as crucial to protect rights, at the same time we also criticize the effectiveness of this very mechanism to protect rights. Going before courts, can be expensive, can be time consuming, and uh, ultimately perhaps not really uh, what is required when we approach, for example, frameworks, but also rights, data protection, but here, of course, all the rights uh, that stem from the UAI Act that are so pervasive, so ubiquitous. So there is really a tension here that we are witnessing uh, uh, in this context. And also there's another point to be made that um, when we talk about effective judicial protection, sometimes we think of it as a source of effectiveness, right? Effectiveness of frameworks. But I think that these two concepts should be kept separate. Um, and they are in fact separate in, in the EU, right? It would be, uh, I think, ideal if they could converge, but in reality the effectiveness of framework cannot be 
um, so to say, made uh, entirely overlap with effective judicial remedies. Uh, and this is because these are very, um, I would say, complex and cumbersome um, frameworks that rely on the presence, as we uh, just heard, of different actors, different uh, administrative bodies, uh, different uh, authorities, different, different level of levels of governance, the EU and the national one, and, and courts, in a way, have just a role in this maze, but they might not have necessarily the ultimate uh, role. So this is something to be kept in mind, I think, when we discuss about governance and how we structure um, uh, uh, frameworks. Now, looking at the uh, AI Act in particular, what is the role for judicial remedies? I think that we have two levels of um, uh, uh, remedial, um, uh, so to say, approaches to harms stemming from the uh, EU AI Act. We have a horizontal level where we have claims between uh, a, a private individual, for example, affected uh, by a decision uh, that was uh, the result of an AI system uh, used by a deployer. But you can also have, of course, a triangular situation where you have a private individual, the deployer, and also the developer of the AI Act, right? Of the, oh, sorry, of the AI system. And then we move forward to a vertical situation where you have an individual and a public authority or public authorities, I would say, in the light of the UAI Act. And of course, the dynamics of, of these remedies are different and also govern, of course, by different rules. In one context, we are in horizontal situations, right? While in the other context, we have a vertical um, situation. Um, and in this, uh, uh, I would say, uh, separation between horizontal and vertical, we have Article 47, right? Article 47 of the EU Charter um, enshrines, but um, so to say, the, the, I would say reaffirms the general principle effective judicial protection of uh, uh, the um, case law of the Court of Justice. Um, Article 47 and the principle do not uh, precisely overlap, the, the general principle is much broader, and Article 47, uh, just to briefly recall, um, provides the right to effective remedies, but also the ability to bring a case before a court for violation of EU rights, uh, and in particular, this, this remedy before a tribunal requires the tribunal to be independent, impartial, and that tribunal to decide within a reasonable time. So everything focuses around the role of courts. Um, now, as I said, uh, we have a contradiction, a contradiction really running uh, through the EU legal order about the importance of judicial remedies, but also the limits of, of EU remedies. And I think this is a narrative that um, has also landed uh, quite well in the GDPR field, right, where uh, a lot of um, uh, criticism has emerged in connection to the tension between the individual, the individuality, I would say, of judicial remedy uh, versus the collectiveness sometimes of the harms that can emerge from um, uh, the GDPR and how, for example, um, judicial remedies cannot often cope very well with this collective right, but even before getting to it, right, the collective interest almost. Uh, that cannot be effectively channeled through um, judicial remedies, even though I, I heard, of course, at a panel uh, before this one, um, uh, uh, Professor Fuster mentioning uh, Article 80 of the GDPR. So anyway, it, it, it's it's quite complex, but not, let's not get into that. Um, now, in the EOAI Act, we don't have any reference, any explicit reference to a right to judicial remedies, uh, which is quite surprising. So I think this is, in fact, the result of all the criticisms that have been raised probably under the GDPR. This is my assumption, at least. The fact that uh, even though in the GDPR we have the possibility to access several judicial remedies in several contexts, nonetheless, they're highly criticized for their ineffectiveness. And perhaps, it's just an assumption, the UAI Act has in a way, internalized and acted upon all this criticism, one can say. Or another interpretation is that, well, um, 
the uh, well the, the institutions didn't think that uh, judicial remedies should play a role but again this is quite surprising in light of the extensive and ubiquitous presence of judicial remedies throughout uh, several EU frameworks. But even though if uh, we don't have a right, um, we have several recitals that mention effective remedies. Um, and, um, and for example, recital um, 59 and 61 refer to judicial remedies in particular in the field of high um, risk AI, AI that is used in the law enforcement democratic um, um, processes. Uh, we also have um, recital 170 that talks about um, the, um, so to say, the preservation of all uh, available judicial remedies uh, in the field of application of the AI Act in light of pre-existing procedures, uh, both at EU at the national level, and in addition to this, of course, there's a right to lodge complaints uh, before the market authority. So this is a remedy, although not judicial, this is rather an administrative uh, remedy. So what is then the role of Article 47 in all of this? Does this mean that Article 47 doesn't really have a role? Um, well, bearing in mind the presence of uh, other legal frameworks under EU and national law through which AI harms could be captured, I think that Article 47 has a very important role of strengthening uh, the um, scrutiny that courts can carry and ensure full judicial review of all the um, uh, the data as well as um, components and uh, algorithms that are used to um, produce, to create um, AI systems. So Article 47 certainly can strengthen uh, this, um, uh, uh, this aspect of, of protection of um, individuals under the EU uh, AI Act. Um, then there's another question, which is that of coordination. And I'm moving now towards uh, the second part. And on this, there isn't much to say. Uh, so I'm actually also moving to the conclusion in the sense that um, it remains to be seen how Article 47 could shape the duties imposed to the authorities um, envisaged under the UAI Act. And I'm referring to uh, the um, market surveillance authority, the notifying bodies, right? Um, but, um, and remains to be seen, right? In the sense that these are administrative bodies. When reading the text of the UAI Act, we read that these bodies should act impartially and independently. So the question is, could aspects, for example, of Article 47 apply to these bodies, thinking about the principle of um, judicial independence of Article 47. Uh, but there are also, uh, in addition to, uh, uh, to this issue, there are also several procedures and aspects of the UAI Act that could potentially be shaped by Article 47. Um, so, um, as I said already, the complaint mechanism to the market authority, but also the notification procedure um, under the EU uh, AI Act. Um, but here there's a question, for example, um, what uh, we read in the AI Act that the market surveillance authority and the notifying body uh, bodies should respect confidentiality. How, can Article 47 defeat this duty of confidentiality when this is necessary to assure effective judicial protection. Um, and then final point be, uh, before concluding, in the context of the coordination between judicial and administrative remedies, um, Article 47 has been interpreted in the Pushkar case as not preventing the exhaustion of administrative remedies before accessing a court. And so I think that the Pushkar case can actually have an important role here in um, uh, rethinking how administrative remedies and judicial remedies could function within the context of the UAI Act. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Probably it's my mistake because I pose a lot of questions to the speakers, so uh, we don't have uh, so much time for questions. And because of this, I would like to give space to the audience for uh, questions if you have. I see one there, if you can go. We are taking the AI Act as 
a uh, transversal uh, legislation. And we try to avoid fragmentation of the market. But on the other hand, we have so many different authorities tasked of enforcement. How can we actually reconcile those two views? I do get that we need some sectoral uh, uh, points and approaches, of course, at some point. But how can we actually make sure that we all end up with the same legal framework and enforcement of the framework in the end of the day? Who would like to, to take this question? I can take it. Okay. <coughs> Miguel? No, I, I think it was actually a very good question. But precisely because you don't want fragmentation, you don't want two different entities giving an opinion on the same thing. Because that way you would drive crazy to any actor in the market. So in order to avoid that, if you were dealing with your medical device before, for example, you have a medical device type 2A which needs a third party conformity assessment, and now you have to comply with requirements for high risk AI systems, you go to your usual suspect, which is usually the drug agency. And that avoids fragmentation because you are not going to handle two different authorities. Okay, and that's for the Annex one. For the Annex, um, for the other Annex, you also have, let's say, uh, you're going to have different situations, okay? Uh, some member states will appoint the Data Protection Authority. Some other member states will have a different authority for each uh, region of the Annex three. Uh, for example, work, the, someone at the Ministry of Work, uh, for, well, data protection agencies, they will be a mix. A mix. In, that, in that case, um, you have a little bit the same thing. You are in your usual business, and what you don't want is two different opinions, because that's what is going to give you problems. And then, uh, let's say that, has, that it needs a horizontal coordination too, but for me, what could introduce some noise in, in the system is, what is happening when uh, an actor in the market has a decision in one member state and then another member state does not agree? And that exactly, that is exactly why, and that was described um, um, well, very well before, the commission might have so much power now because they have the union safeguard procedure. And uh, I can tell you that there are nightmares everywhere because of DPA saying very different things in one country and another one. And this is the main point to avoid in the AI Act. The union, the union safeguard procedure and the coordination of good practices within the AI board is a tool. Um, I don't have a crystal ball, and nor the monopoly of truth. Let's see if it works. But at least it was an idea to try to put this right. So I, I hope it answers a little bit. There are, yeah, there. I think she's almost there, so. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, your different inputs of uh, this uh, complex uh, topic. And uh, my question goes um, about, uh, I mean, how the EU charter, because we are talking about the Article 47, um, but also, I mean, when we are talking about fundamental rights and one of the fundamental rights that comes into my mind in terms of how we can protect with the UAI Act, this uh, right is the fundamental right of non-discrimination. Because also it was a headache in the past for the GDPR and I, I think that this is not going to change with the UAI Act. So is the UAI Act itself a legal source that can protect uh, since the beginning because you know this process of uh, data that is biased since the beginning and the outcomes uh, is going to be enough to solve uh, or to ensure to give a judicial remedy if there is a claim of, uh, of the violation of uh, my fundamental right of non-discrimination? Is it a combination of different legal frameworks? How can we solve the problem? Thank you. I think the question is for Julia. Okay. Okay. It. Yeah. Sure. 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 You of course. Um, I mean, that's that's um, that's a great question, and I think that um, the reality is that um, it all depends on the uh, forum that we want to use. In the sense that, um, of course, the UAI Act provides several administrative remedies. 
So the ability to lodge a complaint, for example, with the market uh, surveillance authority. Um, we have also um, an important role for the commission, as we said. Uh, there's the... Um, uh, Th th there are several procedural requirements to be met. And what is, I think, quite um, distinctive about the OAI Act is that we have more exemptive procedures rather than ex post remedies, right? So the entire governance of the OAI Act is more, uh, it, 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 so to say, is leaning towards administrative, right, remedies as a form of, so to say, preventive regulation. So the UEI Act has this aspiration clearly uh, to prevent uh, the harm uh, before they materialize and hence all the notification procedure, the role for the commission and all of this. But this doesn't mean, of course, that harms won't occur. <laughs> and, and therefore, we also need a safety valve, right, for um, judicial remedies. Um, and when we think about remedies, I think in the legal order, we need to understand what kind of um, act we are attacking, right? And what is the best forum to do so? So everything boils down to uh, the type of measure that we want to challenge, whether it's national, of course, we should go before uh, national courts. But if we have a new um, measure, think about the EU conformity um, decision, right? So we read that um, high-risk uh, AI systems uh, you know, may receive an EU conformity uh, decision. That should be probably, that sounds like a new act. <laughs> and um, I, is this a EU act? And um, and therefore, if that's the case, then we will need to go before EU courts. So it all depends on the act that you want to challenge, in my view. And of course, the rights and the measure and the provisions of the AI Act that you want to invoke. What about the good administration? Of, yes, yeah, good, good administration. Yes, good administration. Of course, is also an important uh, right. But good administration applies mostly to EU institutions. So um, that could be a provision that may be used, for example, to challenge the way in which EU bodies acting within the scope of application of the UAI Act um, are behaving. Uh, but Article 41 has also some specific sub-rights. Uh, access to the file, um, reasoned opinion, and so on. So this applies mostly to EU bodies, but also national bodies working and operating within the realm of EU law. So uh, there is, but this will be mostly for the general principle rather than Article 41 specifically, you know, in my view. Well, thank you for, for for the floor and for the nice uh, debate. Actually, my my question. My name is Sebastian Barjoval. I'm uh, I'm working with the EDPS as well. So sorry for jumping in again, because Brendan already did uh, uh, convey some messages. But we have been thinking recently, and my question is for Maria, about the question precisely of cooperation between the the regulators that are competent to oversee all the different pieces of the digital rulebook puzzle. Let's say. And this is something that you touched on. And I found the idea of the EU digital super regulator, of course, appealing. Uh, we will probably need, need some years to get there if we'll ever get there. But in the meantime, uh, there is a need indeed to establish uh, cooperation routes be between uh, authorities. And there are obstacles, even though we see the Court of Justice pointing your way through sincere cooperation, through, uh, you know, you need to start talking to one another, lest you end up in situations of double jeopardy. Um, but we see a need indeed to establish these cooperation routes and uh, we also want to gather ideas on how to make it work in a practical manner that actually allows authorities to exchange not only knowledge but also relevant information in enforcement cases. And so this is things that we have been thinking about and I would love to hear your thoughts about, about that too. Uh, thanks so much uh, for, for this. It's indeed also uh, uh, very much within my interest, like the overlaps, like obviously the subsequent 
of the overlapping regulations will lead to the co authorities needing to cooperate with each other, not only under AI Act, but let's say under the, the DSA authorities cooperating with AI Act authorities and uh, uh, DPAs. It's already happening. So we had the uh, we had the examples of the DPAs uh, cooperating with uh, competition law authorities, with consumer market authorities. But indeed, there is no legal framework for this. And apart from the uh, Meta case, where the court said indeed that. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the sincere cooperation from the treaties is essentially the rule for the, uh, the authorities to cooperate. That's, that's for now what we have. That's why, I, that is something what I really like about the AI Act, that it actually introduces this, uh, at least some measures and this obligation to cooperate, to involve the fundamental right uh, authorities. So there are already the grants in the AI Act which are not there in the GDPR. So uh, I think this, and, and I think it's the same for the DSA at least, if I remember correctly, that all of these new regulations, they are introducing at least some little legal, grant, uh, legal grants for cooperation, but they are very broad. Uh, because as we saw and the GDPR example shows, it's obviously very important to not over, uh, the DPAs don't like when there are too many deadlines, for example, and that then you, you have the obstacle that we have now with the one-stop shop. That, uh, that's why the cooperation measure, when it's overdone, it, it, can, um, it can backfire. But the, the legal grants need to be there. And I think like in DPS, uh, I saw that recently they are planning to revive the, the digital clearinghouse, if I, uh, if I saw, well, like, uh, that's one of the, I think DP, that's a great uh, position for the DPS to be this platform of, uh, uh, of potential cooperation as a beginning of this conversation. But I agree, definitely there should be, but, but then there's this discussion, and uh, sorry for, for, for this parenthesis, but like, uh, the discussion on the, the lack of EU procedural law in general, uh, because that's the fact, that's the essentially the point of this lack of the rules of information exchange. And I, in the AI Act, I was actually shocked how to broad it, uh, this article that says that all the institutions can have access to all personal data when they are enforcing the the, the, the AI systems uh, and they are, when they are controlling it. I, it's so broad and so dangerous, actually. Um, and we don't have any other framework for now. So definitely there is a need to have, and we, this is the conversation that is to be, that we need to finally have uh, about the, the procedural, right, uh, procedural uh, law of the EU, which is still pending, I guess, so thanks. I think there is time for one short questions. There. There, are, there is another one there. Probably you can collect both of us, and then we can try to reply in yes, very, uh, very fast. <laughs> okay, I'll try to be short. Uh, René Marieu of Open University Netherlands. Um, I, I see that in the AI Act, there's also a role, of, for me, quite unclear role of administrative fines that seem to be much more connected somehow to the structure of GDPR and other le EU legislation and less to the product safety space. Um, but I, I, that I wanted to know, is it that not also an important uh, aspect to take into consideration what kind of authority should start to work with this new framework, given are they used to the type of powers that they will have to work with? And um, I'm especially interested in uh, Miguel's view on, on this, but also if others have any uh, ideas on that. Thank you very much, uh, Ursula Pahl, previously with Biuk and soon with Noib. I wanted to ask a question because I did not hear anything about collective uh, interests and the representative action directive, which came in through the European Parliament. So the AI Act is now part of the annex of the representative uh, action directive, and that means in case of collective interest to consumers, that civil society organizations can take actions, and so that means uh, judicial remedies that can be injunctive relief or can be compensation or other remedies. And that was not mentioned. I think it's a huge step that the AI Act has made because of the push of the European Parliament. And I hope that there will be a big a role also for civil society to use that right. I just wondered what the panelists think about that. Thank you. One minute extra because we're... <laughs> well, I, I think it was a very, very pertinent question regarding the, the fines, eh, the administrative fines. <coughs> you have uh, different groups of fines depending on where you are making infringements, and I think that you know that. First thing, 
that is, uh, and also for models, for uh, general purpose hay models, of course, for those you also have um, specific fines. It's market surveillance authorities that are going to, to, to impose those fines, meaning that depending on the sector you are dealing with, that system, then you are, it's going to be one entity or another, the one imposing the fine. But there's some detail on it, okay, because uh, the AI Act imposes the quantity and imposes on what? Provisions are more than uh, than the obligations for high-risk AI systems. But there's a specific thing over there that is very important. Member states are obliged to draft national law to establish how exactly they are going to impose their fines. And they have a deadline to do that. So meaning that even if you have the framework, which is very important because with that fines you can really have the strength on, on, on on making things happen in the, in, the, in the regulation, you need a little bit more of detail on how specifically you are going to impose them during in, in, at national level. Meaning that for the areas and the reasons is going to be more or less the same, but due to these specificities on how the market surveillance authorities are, are, are done, then of course uh, you will have to set up some rules on this is the one saying this, this is the one saying that. But in general, I think it's very well controlled. It's a very good tool, and and and, and it's very nice. And I'm I'm going to go super quick to the to the to the, to the second question because I remember very well when we were discussing that, and that stayed. Some other things not. The effective uh, the, the right for a judicial remedy also was in the text at some point, yeah. and we smashed it. Yeah. Why? Because it's not needed. It's absolutely recognized in every member state of every single nation from the, from the European Union. But we wanted to remind that it's there. So the, the fact of being on the legal text was a redundancy. During, that was, was thought during the negotiations. Eh? That's not, that does not mean that I'm saying this uh, because it's me. Eh? But during the negotiations, it was that the right is there. Every member state has a right to go for a judicial remedy. Uh, so. It's a duplication to put in the, in the in the legal text in the operative part, but let's let's say it in the in the in the in the recitals. That's what we said. Of course, uh, then you had different opinions, and you pointed some of them. <laughs> so so, but yeah, it's it's a little bit. But but the one on on the on the users was one of the of of, of those remedies that were important for for many for many. Eh? Uh, they were accepted also for from the council because there was a value on them. Yeah. Well, we are out of time. Thank you for your intervention. I learned a lot. Thank you all. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Um, well, uh, I would uh, like to to, Im to invite you for uh, then for the, the, the cocktail and uh, because we need it after this session, uh, very, very intense. But thank you because I'm serious. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this panel and to, I mean, to, to moderate this panel. Thank you. <laughs>